good morning, and welcome to our Sunday morning broadcast. Today's service is led by Pastor Tony Blevins, whose message is, God is up to something. Lydia Rogers and the worship team lead the congregational hymns. Accompaniment is provided by Daniel Hardin on piano and Lois Estes on the organ. Today, we feature the lighting of the Advent candle. Please join Pastor Wes Larson as he begins today's service. Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday morning service. And uh, we are just uh, doing it online today, uh, only today, uh, November 29th. And glad to have you with us. Next Sunday, remember, we will be back to in-person services. And we will have services at 8, 9, and 10.30 a.m., your choice, next Sunday. Glad to have you here. This is the first Sunday of Advent. It's Christmas season, and we are excited. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you that we have the privilege of being in your house today, God. We just ask that uh, everyone would feel your touch and your Holy Spirit this morning as we worship you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for worship today.
Good morning. It's so good to see everybody this morning. I wish I could actually see you in person, and I can't, but I can pretend. So if you want to sing with us, please, be, please stand up and sing with us, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. marks our first Sunday in Advent, and we're going to begin our uh, lighting of the Advent wreath with singing the first verse of um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So if you would sing with us, please. Until on Christmas Eve, the full wreath of Advent candles is lit to symbolize that Christ, the light of the world, has arrived. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. Please join me in the liturgy and read the words in bold as a congregation. Lighting a candle in the darkness helps us find our way in darkness, we lose direction. We can't see where we've been or where we're going. A single candle flickering brightly helps us find our way again. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. All we know is that nothing seemed right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We, we need Advent. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judea. 
In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judea will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Today we light the candle of hope. May it remind us of God's great promise to us. He is our hope. He is our Redeemer. And He is our Savior. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Let's sing together the second verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father, during this Advent season, may we be reminded of your promises to us and your fulfillment of them. Help us to prepare our lives for his Advent within us. That in his precious name we, of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's sing together, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. special treat. Melanie Clevenger has recorded a special music piece for us this morning to listen to in our service. So please enjoy.
When we enter into the season of Advent, most of us are thinking about Christmas. Usually right after Thanksgiving and everyone has their Christmas decorations up or those who are a little bit more traditional about that, like myself, are just then starting to get their Christmas decorations out and think about putting up Christmas decorations. When I was a kid, nobody put up Christmas decorations until December at least. It was extremely early to do anything otherwise. Now everybody just puts them out. Well, just leave them up year-round, right? And why not? It's a good season, and the memories that that brings up for us are profound, life-changing. By the way, do you have a favorite Christmas movie? I have a couple of them. I, I mean, uh, I could go through a list but most people have a favorite that they like to watch. That's why there's some of the cable channels that will run a particular movie for, what, 24 hours at a time uh, coming up on Christmas. It's a Wonderful Life is one of my favorite uh, Christmas movies. That one is classic, and it's just hard to beat. Uh, another one of my favorite uh, Christmas movies is uh, A Christmas Story, The Kid Who Wants the BB Gun. And... Uh, I'm going to guess that the folks who are here, uh, this is our choir today, by the way. Great job, guys. Excellent work there. Uh, I'm guessing each of you have a favorite Christmas movie, don't you? And uh, just about everybody does. So I was thinking about that, and here's what occurred to me. I was just thinking, somebody should make a uh, Christmas movie about the entire nativity. How about that? And then I realized, oh, there's been a few of those. Not in the classics or anything, but there have been several attempts at that. The series that we begin for Advent this year is Once Upon a Time in Bethlehem. And our very first talk in that series is just simply, God is up to something. And I, what I mean by that is God is always up to something. And we see that illustrated no more clearly than what we see in the time leading up to the birth of Christ. If you look at once upon a time in Bethlehem, what, over 2,000 years ago, the entire world, at least to those who were involved in this, their world was in total disarray, just falling apart all around them. Meanwhile, for the Roman Empire, it was historically referred to as the Pax Romana, or a time of peace. Time of peace indeed for Rome, but that peace had come at the tremendous price of a heavy-handed, oppressive government. In that case, how do you have peace? Why, you immediately squash and, and destroy any potential uprising or anything that could uh, possibly disturb the peace. Get rid of all your enemies. That was the approach of Rome. And so they were in a time of peace and a world in total disarray. In Israel, God's people were under the rule of this maniacal, abusive leader who had been working systematically for years to limit their freedoms and exploit their labor. Throughout Israel, the expectation of the coming Messiah, God's chosen one to lead the nation or to lead them into a time of peace, time of prosperity and potentially independence once again. That expectation was at its peak. I call your attention to one particular scripture in Micah chapter five. It reads like this. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. <clears throat> and many of the translations on that are probably more accurate in saying, <clears throat> whose goings forth are of old, from everlasting because we understand that the Messiah has no beginning or end. He is eternal. And yet there is a distinct point in history where the Messiah, as God in the flesh, became one of us. And that's what we're talking about through Advent. You see, the word Advent means a coming or arrival. 
Israel had had this expectation or an anticipation of the arrival or the coming of the Messiah for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, in our day and time, we look at Advent and we say this, Christ has indeed come. And we look back and commemorate that, and we look back and celebrate that because of what it means for all of us, for the entire world, for all of creation, the entire universe. But we also have this anticipation in our lives. It's an advent, but it's what we would call the second advent of the Messiah. Because we know, as sure as the promise of the coming of the Messiah is the promise of God that Christ will return. And so the second advent is our earnest hope and expectation in this lifetime for Israel, the coming of the Messiah. And here's the, here's the parallel to those I'd like you to see. They had no idea how soon the coming of Messiah would be. Those living in that generation just hit the jackpot, didn't they? I mean, imagine the few generations before them, their same expectation, their same hopefulness. The Messiah could come at any moment. And we live in a similar sense of expectation and anticipation. But let's review a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes in this. First of all, as we all know, there is the promise of the Messiah. We know the scriptures, what we just read in Micah, and there's uh, dozens of other prophecies that point to the Messiah and of him coming and all that would take place. But the story doesn't just begin there with the Micah prophecy. It begins much earlier. Even in the Garden of Eden, at the fall of the human race, when God made a promise. And we see from that time going forward, promise after promise that a Savior would be coming. So then throughout all of Israel's history, they continued to talk about this Messiah. Uh, different generations uh, based on how which prophets had spoken and how much light or illumination they had based on the revelation of the prophets uh, had varying amounts of information about the Messiah. But each generation continued to talk about the Messiah, the prophecies about him, and what would happen when Messiah came. Hundreds of such prophecies ultimately fulfilled in the one we know as Jesus. At the time of this, though, there was a man in Israel known as Herod the Great, a very insecure man and ruthless. His interest in the child Jesus, when he heard about the Messiah being born, was sinister in nature because he saw this new infant king as a threat to his power, his authority, his throne. Other events leading up to that, if you look behind the scenes, everything that was coming into play, it just so happened that Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire, during this part of the Pax Romana, or the time of peace, decided around this time that a worldwide census would be a great idea. Obviously, you can't tax your citizens. You can't conscribe the young men into military service if you don't know who they are and where they are. So it was important for him to gain this kind of information. And as it just so happened, he issued this decree saying that everyone was to return to their ancestral city, the places where their family held land and history, property, wherever their family is from, and to register their residency and all of their personal details. It was collecting that information. During that time is when we're introduced to a man named Joseph. Now, in our English translations of Scripture, we're told that Joseph was a carpenter. I grew up hearing about Joseph, a carpenter, and I pictured a guy with a saw and hammer and uh, some carpenter's tools doing that sort of thing. Then later I got this idea, well, no, a carpenter in that day didn't really work with hammer and uh, 
wood and a saw and that sort of thing. But instead, the, the carpenter those days were more of a stonemason. And so I was like, well, okay. And then later, as I've studied that, I've learned that the word tecton, which was the word ascribed to Joseph, translated carpenter in our English, really means a skilled craftsman, a tradesman, that he had the ability to make things. And uh, it usually entailed a wide variety of skills and could be very artistic and helpful. But we have Joseph the tecton, or carpenter if you want to call him that. In Matthew, we read about Joseph's history, his ancestral lineage. And what's really interesting here is this. We find out that Joseph's lineage goes back to Jeconiah. Now, Jeconiah was interesting in the history of Israel in that God had cursed that genealogy or that ascendancy by simply saying, no one from Jeconiah's line would ever sit on the throne of David. And yet the prophecy of the Messiah is, he will sit on the throne of David. So what's going on with this? And then in Luke, we see another genealogy, which most people attribute to the family of Mary. We certainly know this, that Mary was the daughter of Heli Yochim, the direct line to the throne of David. Heli was, contrary to popular belief, not a peasant, but one of the wealthiest men in the world. We'll probably get a little bit more about that throughout our Advent series. I don't want to shock you too much this early into this. But just for the record, no, Mary was not a poor peasant girl. She was direct line of the throne of David and the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in the known world at her time. We see all of these factors coming together. We see the world in the condition that it was in. We see all the way back to the Garden of Eden and we see God even there had opened up the door of hope, which indeed is the theme with the first Advent candle today, hope. God opened the door of hope at the very time the human race fell into sin with Adam and Eve and began to project the arrival of the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer, and what would happen when he arrived. Advent is all about that. But as we look at all of this and see these different factors all come into play, what are some of the lessons that come out of that for us? A couple that I would mention. First of all, God is at work behind the scenes. God is always at work behind the scenes. Therefore, God is at work behind the details in the scene of your life to make everything come together. Now think about that for just a moment. Look at how detailed the workings of God were behind the curtains, behind the scenes, and the literally hundreds of years leading up to the birth of Christ. And we get a lesson about ourselves from that. Your life might be in disarray. It might feel like there's no peace whatsoever. You might not know what you're going to be able to do tomorrow or what you're doing for income. You might not know your way through illnesses that your family has. We look at our world in disarray with the COVID virus and the absolute uh, disarray that that has created, and many people lose hope. But one thing we can be sure of is this. God was never taken by surprise. The virus didn't come along in our lifetimes and all of a sudden God is scrambling to fix things because, oops, I didn't see that one coming. It doesn't work that way. God knew all about it. God had things in play for your life, details behind the scenes, people you haven't met yet that God has appointed for you to cross paths with, answered prayers that are going to be coming your way to bring the details of your life together. Look at all that God brought together through centuries 
so that the Messiah was born according to all the prophecies and born in the little town of Bethlehem, a town of under a thousand people. And yet that was the prophecy. It seemed impossible. And yet God worked out details through the ordering of the census, through the chosen parents and all the other details so that they arrived in the right place at the right time for the arrival of God in human flesh. Do you not think then that God is at work behind the scenes in your life to bring the details together? So the second idea that goes right along with that is simply this. The outcome of his work will certainly be good. And I'm talking about in your life. When God is at work behind the scenes, bringing all the details together, God is up to something and it's something good in your life. Whatever you're going through in your life right now, you can be sure God is at work. God is behind the scenes arranging circumstances and people and events, everything coming into place lined up perfectly for the right things to happen in your life. For example, I had uh, an experience just this past week, and this happens with most of us all the time, where I was being asked to spend some time with an individual uh, who seemed to uh, be a little bit confused in life. And it was a time that was pretty busy for me. And then it just dawned on me this thought. I think God is sending me the task of trying to help this person. I went and spent the time with this individual and learned some amazing things about his life and what God was doing. And I believe that he was encouraged through our time together. And it occurs to me that God has those divine appointments of people that come our way in life. And we yield to that and we become part of the work that God is doing behind the scenes prepared for someone else. It happens for us as well. Another Joseph that we read about in Scripture all the way back in Genesis, as you recall, his brothers sold him into slavery for a few bucks. Years later, Joseph was the one who saved their family and pretty much the rest of the world from famine. And not only his family and all of Egypt and the world around them. And when they came and asked for forgiveness, he said, you intended this to me to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish the saving of many lives. What appear to be circumstances that are intolerable are often God's work that we're completely unaware of, and it comes into fruition later. To look at our circumstances and try to better it isn't a flaw, but to look at our circumstances and not realize God is at work regardless of what our circumstances look like, then we begin to understand. And that brings us to what is my closing thought. For these reasons, you can face your future with patient expectation. We call that hope. God has opened that door to hope all the way back in Genesis. But God has opened up broader and broader reasons and given us more and more light and illumination to see our reasons for hope with the coming of Christ and all that we've learned since then. You see, we don't always know what God is doing or why, and not always sure how things are going to work out. But we can be sure that things will work out and God is doing something good through it. You see, God will fulfill his purpose for you. God is up to something. God has been up to something throughout all of history. It's no different for your life. From the opening pages of Genesis to this moment right now. For some reason, God had it that we would do a video for worship today of all days. Do you not believe that God is up to something and that something good will come from that that would not have come otherwise? I'm asking you to believe that because I'm seeing the promises of God and I'm seeing how God works and I know that's how God builds hope in our lives. God is bringing everything together for his glory and your good. And that's why in this first Sunday of Advent, the key word 
is hope. We have every reason for hope because God is up to something, something good, and God's going to make it happen in your life. Let me invite you to pray with me. Our God, we're, we are grateful that you've given us hope, the expectation that the things in our life have purpose and meaning. They're not just random, meaningless events disconnected, but rather part of a greater plan, part of an orchestration finely tuned for the events, people, and circumstances in our lives that we've met and that we've come across and many that we have not yet encountered. And God, we put our expectation, our hope in you in trusting your promises today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you sing with us while shepherds watched their flocks? If you're catching this video today, I want to thank you for worshiping with us at Kimberling City United Methodist Church. And I know that many who will be watching are actually members of Kimberling City United Methodist Church. And we so appreciate your faithfulness to this ministry as well as your faithfulness to Christ. And uh, this reminder is simply that even though we're not worshiping in person, we stu still have many ministries taking place. We're helping people in our world, in our community. And I would encourage you to continue to support the ministries of the church as you always have so generously. Again, you can give online. You can send your uh, check or your offering to the church. Also uh, include with that, if you have uh, a prayer request you want us to be aware of or a need, contact us about that so that we can be in ministry with you in that way. I also want to remind you that unless things change, it is our plan to uh, have in-person worship next Sunday, December 6th. And the way we will do that is we will have an 8 a.m. worship, 9 a.m. worship, and 1030 a contemporary worship. The reason for that is by spreading out our attendance over the eight o'clock and nine o'clock for traditional worship, we can keep our uh, overall capacity below the percentage that it needs to be uh, to meet the local guidelines and the uh, recommendation of our own bishop. So uh, that's what we'll be doing starting next Sunday, 8 a.m. traditional worship, 9 a.m. traditional worship, and our contemporary or connect worship at 1030. And uh, we so thank you for being a part of this ministry and this church family. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Just after that will be the postlude with Danielle playing. And that is our exit from worship back into the other events of our lives. Let's pray together. God, each person who has caught any of this worship time is precious to you. Each person who shares in that, we know how special they are. Each detail of their life, their feelings, the things that hurt them, the things that make them happy, the things that make them generous or helpful to others. All of those details are important to you. And God, we pray that we could connect with one another with that understanding so that we have respect and love and care. And God, that we treat people the way we would love to be treated. 
God, we just pray right now through this Advent season that you would find in us a loving and kind and helpful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. We are taking prudent precautions concerning the virus. Therefore, we're making changes in our Sunday service schedule. Effective on Sunday, December 6th, we will offer three services, 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. traditional and 10.30 a.m. contemporary. We welcome your attendance, but our allowed seating is limited. Please first register with the church office. Our office number is 417 439-4395. That's 417-739-4395. We also record both our traditional and contemporary services. Please visit our website, umckc.org, to select the service you wish to view. The 9 a.m. service recording is available at 11 on Vimeo. The 1030 service recording is available at 2 o'clock on YouTube. Until we meet again... Stay safe, and may God bless you.